There is a great divide in the gaming community, but that's normal. We are human, walking contradictions. On the one hand, we are pack animals. We need to be a part of something greater than ourselves. That's why society exists. It's within our instincts. On the other hand, no two of us are the same. There are always slight differences. To reconcile that, we group up based on some but not all similarities. On a geographic scale, for example, we are all on the planet Earth. Then we split into subgroups based on our continents, which in themselves then split based on countries, then regions, cities, neighborhoods, streets, apartment complexes, floors, flats, and so on and on. However, we are living in the age of the internet. Location is becoming less and less important when it comes down to human connection. Many of you live in the United States, at least based on my last video's analytics. Yet I am basically on the other side of the world, if a sphere even has sides. Even online, we still group up. Now, based on our interests, ideologies, and maybe even still location, because nationalism. Gamers are one of those large groups. And as we said already, this group will too split itself into many pieces based on different parameters. You have console gamers, PC gamers, mobile gamers and anything in between for once. Multiplayer, single player, PvP, PvE, story games, trial and fail games, silly games and so on. With so many differences, one must admit there is no way for a single game to satisfy everyone. For example, Helldivers 2, the biggest game right now which many praise, also did have to face this fact. And kudos to the developers for sticking to their principles, when a group of loud PvP gamers demanded such a game mode be added. The developers simply said, no, the game is just not for you mate. As you can see, these big divides can cause the louder members to become entitled or toxic, like League of Legends players. One of the big divides comes from the age-old debate, to compete or to not compete. What is a competitive game? What is a competition? Where do they come from? One of these is easy to answer, the rest not so much. I am not here to discuss these questions. This video has already started to be way more philosophical than intended. We all know what a competitive game is. It is CSGO, a game where skill is the reason to win and winning is always the number one priority. On the other hand, we have casual games. Games meant to be just for fun or with a deep story or difficult tests. In these games you need not possess the best skill or the longest experience to be good. Or conversely, you do need these but not to beat someone else, instead only to overcome the challenges set by the game dev. One important thing is that simply from a logical standpoint, casual gamers far outnumber competitive gamers. Just think about it. Most gamers are either kids who are too young to care, teens who are too busy with school and social life, or adults who are even busier with everything. Wake up, go to your 9-to-5 job, take care of your children, elderly parents and so on. At the end of the day, it's unlikely you have the energy or mental strength needed for a highly competitive game. I myself claim to be a casual gamer. That is one reason why, in the end of my last video, I proclaimed that Paladins is better than Overwatch for the casual gamer. There is no denying that Overwatch is better suited to be competitive. Which game is better in general cannot really be answered. It is a personal matter. Still, from the standpoint of large companies, which are almost always driven by the one and only root of all evil, money itself, they would want to target the largest possible audience, and thus the casual. Yet they are competitive only games, such as the aforementioned CSGO, Valorant or its older brother, League. These games rely on their large eSport scenes that always require some competitiveness to exist, even though they can take casual games and compete in challenges, such as speedruns. These competitive only games are the exception, not the norm. Most games, no matter how competitive they try to be, still have some casual aspects for that sweet, sweet audience engagement. Such is the case with Overwatch, which can live without its competitive scene but will live or die by its casual audience. Most games take the approach of adding a ranked mode for the competitive gamers in a standard mode for the casuals. Though that is a reasonable solution, it isn't perfect. The competitive spirit can, and very often does, transfer into the casual mode, meaning that those gamers who are playing for fun are bombarded by insults for not being optimal. If you've played any MOBA, you know exactly what I mean. Despite all of that, 
many casual gamers still carry on playing those competitive centric games, undeterred by the toxicity or just going at it with friends, such is the case with me and the game from the title of this video. No need to delay it any longer, let's talk about Apex Legends. So. That was almost a page and a half long intro, nice of you to still be listening. I am the great Terlik. Thank you for joining me if you are new and welcome back to everyone else. Today we'll talk about Apex Legends, the game that's to me the most casual friendly competitive game. The main meat of this video will be an overview of Apex Legends itself. Then, at the end we'll talk about its casual and competitive aspects to try and understand why I, and hopefully many others, keep coming back to it even when not caring about the win. As before, the video will be split into a couple parts, so let us begin. Apex Legends is a battle royale game that came out in 2019, developed by Respawn and published by most gamers' biggest enemy, EA. Actually, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but to me, Nintendo is worse. That's beside the point. For those who somehow don't know, a battle royale is a genre of games that was huge in the late 2010s. It all started with two games, PUBG and Fortnite. Both were very successful and Fortnite for once was actually playable. And boy was it making money. Where there is money, big companies will follow. Unsurprisingly, hi -Rez, the makers of Paladins known for hopping on trends, made the realm royale. There was one about vampires and if you've ever played the game Battle Right, that had a battle royale too. Call of Duty had and actually still has a battle royale. There were a lot more and I honestly don't remember them all. The important thing is that for a while battle royales were constantly coming out and they were indeed everywhere. While all of this was happening, EA was wondering how to get into the trend. One of their studios, Respawn, was at this point known for their Titanfall series. The games were praised by most, yet in the eyes of Papa EA, they did not bring in enough cash. The Respawn team wanted to keep making games in the Titanfall universe. In one of their so-called action blocks, small game prototypes people in the company would make to pitch ideas, the then young battle royale genre made its way into the discussion, and so it was decided that the next game in the Titanfall universe would in fact be a battle royale. As a consequence, one of Titanfall's key characteristics, the giant mechs known as Titans, had to go. Thus, Apex was born, EA got its trendy game and the rest is history. That's how the game came to be, but how does it play? Apex is a battle royale as we already talked about, but it is also a hero shooter. The two main game modes are duos and trios. At the beginning of the match, every player in the squad picks one of 25 legends, split into 5 groups. Assault, Skirmisher, Recon, Support or Controller. Notice that you can have up to 3 people in a squad, but there are 5 classes. This way the game can actually allow for more variation, unlike the opposite case where you have 3 classes and 5 teammates. This can end up with the devs forcing a specific composition on everyone. Overwatch. Each class has their own passives and defining qualities. Assault legends are the ones who focus on combat, they deal damage or disrupt the enemies in one way or another. Passively, they can open special assault crates and carry more ammo. Skirmishers are the assassin class of the game. Their abilities help them go in, pick someone out and hopefully get out, so they mainly focus on mobility. Passively, they can also scan care packages from a distance to decide if they're worth it. Recon legends take care of recon, obviously. They gather information before, during and after fights. Passively, they can use special beacons spread through the map to reveal enemies for a while. Support legends are a team-oriented bunch. Their abilities help them protect, kill and in general assist their team. One legend even makes looting way easier. Passively, they also have a special crate that only they can open and, by simply existing, they allow others to craft banners. More about that in a bit. Finally, controllers are the smallest class. They focus on locking down an area, making them less mobile, which in this game is questionable at best. Passively, they can use special consoles to see future rings to help them set up easier. Once everyone has picked a legend, the game begins. A ship flies in a straight line through the map. One person on the team is decided to be the jump master. They pick when to go and where. 
If you're the jump master and you don't want to be, you can pass the responsibility on to someone else, but don't be surprised if it ends up looping back to you. If, on the other hand, you are not the jump master, but you don't like where they're taking you, you can always just unfollow them and go wherever you wish. Upon landing, you start with essentially nothing. Then you loot, finding guns and other resources, fight as the damaging ring shrinks the arena, and the last squad standing wins. Things you can find include ammo, grenades, helmets, backpacks, shields, consumables such as medkits, shield cells, utility items like heat shields, mobile respawn beacons or evac towers. Your health is split into two parts. Every legend has the same 100 base HP and then depending on their armor level has an additional 50 to 125 more. You can heal shields faster though, so that's their plus. How exactly armor works has changed a lot through the years. I'd split them into three eras. The beginning era, armor was as basic as possible. The level you have is how much you get. You can't change your armor unless you find better one. During this time, legends would spawn with nothing on. If I am not mistaken, they introduced a second type of armor for an event. Evo armor begins as the weakest possible variant and levels up as you deal more damage. The player base responded so well to the new Evo armor that eventually we reached the second era, the classic Evo era. Respawn removed all normal armor and replaced it with Evo armor. Moreover, legends would spawn with a basic loadout of a starter level Evo armor, a shield and a helmet. During this time you could find high level armor on the ground but it was always evil armor. Also, if you took the armor of your enemy, you'd inherit their progress towards leveling the armor up. This was how things were for the longest time, until the very latest update, season 20, when the newest era began. The customization era. There is no more armor on the ground, instead every legend begins with their own custom armor. The armor can now upgrade with much more than just damage. Don't get me wrong, damage is still the best way to get your armor level but using your class passive or collecting special EVO XP crates is an option if there aren't enemies nearby. When you kill someone you can no longer just get their armor, but instead you take their armor core which will grant you the amount of shield even if your level is lower but the extra HP will be temporary. Lastly, whenever you upgrade your armor, you also get to pick between new perks which are specific to each legend. That's all about health. Now what if you lose it? You first get downed. You can crawl around and use your shield for protection. Your allies can pick you up if you don't die again, which can happen by either losing your new health or by a timer running out. When that happens, you're officially dead, but that's not the end. Your teammates can then retrieve your banner and use it as a respawn beacon or use the previously mentioned mobile respawn beacons. Around the map there are also crafting machines, which were majorly changed in season 20. No matter that, if you have a support teammate, you can use a crafter to make a banner instead of risking your skin. This is more or less the gameplay. As you can see, there is a lot. Even so, in the middle of combat it isn't that much and in fact comes naturally to most gamers as it is a pretty standard battle royale business. Maps are large and varied and in general the gameplay is very well made. Still, no hero shooter type game would be complete without the characters themselves. Every legend in the game has a unique passive, active tactical and active ultimate ability. That however is not all. Legends also have unique hitboxes and animations, which can make the illusion of unique movement speeds. But HP and speed as well as backpack size are all the same between legends. To balance the hitboxes, some larger legends have a unique damage multiplier which makes them take 15% less of it. Let's take a look at all the legends one by one in one sentence each. Bloodhound. A non-binary space Amish embraces guns and enters a blood sport to honor their dead close ones only to find new love. Gibraltar, big man does big dumb, crashing his father's car and endangering his boyfriend, so he enters a blood sport to help people, I guess. Lifeline, rich girl gets angry at her parents for being rich and evil, so she enters a blood sport in the name of humanitarianism. Pathfinder, funny robot man was actually the messiah but forgot so he takes many jobs, gets into goofy situations and ends up in a blood sport. Rafe, edgy anime girl is actually very powerful and was experimented on, so she is 
now in a Bloodsport making use of the most broken ability, having a tiny hitbox. Bangalore, ex-foot soldier who was on the wrong side of history, enters a Bloodsport to get money in the name of finding her maybe dead brother. Caustic, gas man made of absolute evil is evil and loves poisonous gas, also he is in the games to escape the feds. Mirage, goofy man is actually severely depressed cause his mom has dementia and he feels like he amounts to nothing. So, he joins a blood sport to cope. Octane. Junkie Daredevil lives for the thrill and blows his own legs off, so he joins a blood sport to keep his ADHD ass entertained. Watson. French girl whose father made the ring of the games enters them after dad dies for reasons I don't know. Crypto. Professional hacker hacks the wrong guy and gets his sister disappeared, then enters the games for retribution. Revenant, killer robot does not know he's a robot until he walks off a giant glass shard in the neck and then gets mad, so he gets put into a blood sport to calm down, but he doesn't. Loba, professional thief whose dad was killed by a mad killer robot enters the games after said robot does so to try and take revenge. Rampart, silly engineer has her shop burned down to the ground, so she enters a blood sport for fun, I'm actually not quite sure in this one. Horizon. Brilliant scientist somehow survives the event horizon of a black hole, but time travels as a result, so she enters a blood sport to find a way to travel 80 years back. Fuse Funny Space Australian enters a blood sport because Space Australia and ends up finding love in his 50s, so it is never too late. Valkyrie The daughter of a great mercenary who was killed in the revolution enters a blood sport to carry on his legacy. Seer Evil moon hippie does big business with the evil head of the games and then enters them for some reason. I don't really care about Seer. Ash Robot assassin remembers her human life and doesn't like it, so she enters a blood sport because killing is a fun way to get your mind off of things. Mad Maggie, a warlord from Space Australia, gets sentenced to death by blood sport, even though that's not how the Epic Games work. Newcastle, ex soldier who fought for the bad guys, moved on but had to enter a blood sport to protect his family, eventually bumping into his sister. Vantage, a mama's girl enters herself and her pet bat into a blood sport to clear her mom's name and get her out of prison. Catalyst, a moon mystic sticks by her close friend until shit gets wild, so she enters the games to fight the evil moon hippie. Ballistic, ex blood sport star comes back to the scene so his son doesn't get himself killed and surprisingly keeps up with the youth. Conduit, a somewhat delusional girl gives herself space cancer so she could stop cosplaying as a contestant and straight up enter the blood sport itself. The legend's personalities are definitely a highlight of Apex and luckily Respawn knows it. They constantly post comics on social media moving the story forward. They also have lore events in the game and very well produced animations on their YouTube channel. They have even begun to do stories over multiple seasons. What the legends actually do in game? Let's go for a second round of one sentence descriptions to find out. The premier recon legend Bloodhound can track anyone and then go feral on their ass old school style. The standard tank of the game, Gibby has a big shield, a small shield and an orbital strike while being the best pick me upper. The basic bitch support character, Lifeline can, as her name implies, heal, pick you up easier and call in supplies. While not really having a passive, Path has a grappling hook which as Gravity Falls taught us is OP and can also make ziplines for his team. Equipped with an overpowered hitbox and a great escape tool, Rave can also sometimes help her team out with a portal. She is the soldier archetype. Run fast, make cover and call in rockets. If it ain't broke, why fix it? As he is the gas man, Caustic uses gas traps and gas grenades to slow and damage his enemies, or more likely to herd them like sheep. The funny man uses clone tech to distract his enemies while picking his teammates up and being a general nuisance. With the power of drugs, Octane can go fast at the price of his health, which luckily automatically regenerates. And he can also make a jump pad. Watson believes the world must be put into order and she does so with her fences and big pylon that stops grenades. Her big brain also allows her to get the most out of a specific consumable. Hackerman here has a drone he uses to track people and turns into an EMP from time to time. After the rework, Rev can crawl fast, 
climb faster and longer, jump around like a madman and gain a big shield that comes with an even bigger hitbox. One of the best support characters, Loba can see high level loot from afar, teleport with a grenade-like projectile and makes looting way easier for everyone. Rampart loves big guns, so she makes their ammo even more, while also making special covers for everyone and bringing her own machine gun. Being so used to wonky gravity, Horizon has softer falls, makes a gravity lift for movement and a big black hole type object to suck in everyone. As he is a space Australian, Fuse likes bombs, carrying more, having built-in ones and, to put the cherry on top, he can make a lot of fire. Valk flies, launches missiles and can scan people while landing from the ship, which she can sort of do again with her ultimate. By the power of the moon, Seer can scan people in two shapes, one which looks like something YouTube won't like me to talk about and a dome, while also listening to your heartbeat constantly. Ash is a weird combo of finding you through the corpses you leave behind, locking you in place for a bit and using a katana to teleport. Being a warlord from space Australia, Maggie here loves shotguns, hates cover, using her fire drill and wrecking ball to get rid of it. The second support tank of the game, Newcastle can make a castle, make a wall and shields you while also dragging you around when he picks you up. Vantage comes with a bat that helps her find people, jump around as well as her own sniper rifle that causes future bullets to hurt more. By the power of magnetic fluids, Catalyst can fortify doors, make spike traps and a giant wall to remove line of sight. As his name implies, guns are the name of the game for Ballistic, being able to hold three of them, coming with a fourth that makes enemies overheat and amping up his arsenal to boot. By the power of space cancer, Conduit can run faster towards teammates, give them temporary armor and create big bubbles that slow people down. As I said earlier, legends now have special perks tied to their armor level, but I'm not going to go over that too, because the video is getting way too long. So why don't we now discuss why I like the game so much in the first place. So, now that you know what Apex is, here comes the big question. Why is this game so casual friendly, yet competitive? Let us begin with the easier of the two, the competitive part. As has been said many times, Apex is a battle royale, a genre which in itself comes with a not negligible amount of competition. What Apex does, which Fortnite for example doesn't, is take its combat very seriously. As I told you, legends have only three abilities, one passive and two active. They are useful, yes, but they are not enough. This is an overwatch. If you want to kill someone, you need to know how to fight with the basic guns and movements every legend has. Oh, and the movement? This game is a spiritual sequel to Titanfall, and though the movement is not to its level, it goes way more in depth than you might think. When it comes to the casual side, you have pretty much everything else. The fun and varied legends, for once, bring a lot of enjoyment with their many different voice lines. On our earlier remarks about toxicity, the players of Apex do not really seem to communicate too much through text, at least in the casual game mode, and if you're like me and you don't like microphones, there is no way for you to have your experience sullied. While you might think that in a team-based game you'd need some sort of communication, worry not, because Apex was one of the pioneers of the ping systems that we are all so accustomed to now. Some people say that even if it isn't always about winning, you can't enjoy constant losses, but in Apex, at least to me, every one fight, hell, Every down is a win and that comes in part from the great sound design of the game. Moreover, when you get to win here and there, it is even better, despite the fact that the game will then put a target on your back in your next match. Finally, we have something I have yet to mention and that is the additional game modes. Once upon a time there was the arena game mode and even though I did love it, I really did, the new mixtape game modes are better. There are three modes, a team deathmatch, a control point and a 3v3v3v3 gun run. I hope I don't have to explain those. Every 15 minutes they change which game mode is available on a rotation, while for some that might be annoying because they want to just go all in on the control for example, by using the rotation 
We both stop a competitive environment from forming because people would need to wait for 30 minutes to go back into that game, which who would do that, but we also prevent burnout, which is very important to casual gaming. Mixtape is meant to be super casual, and believe it or not, it is. Sometimes I play mixtape, others I play battle royale, sometimes I play both, and sometimes, of course, you play neither. Another thing about mixtape is that it is a great way to get a hang on the combat without having to overload your system with all the rest that comes with a standard battle royale. In the end, we have to remember the golden rule of casual gamers. When you feel tired of playing something, just do what M. Cote told you and play something else. I have not even played every season in Apex. I think I counted them, I've played about two thirds of every season and like a good quarter of that two thirds was maybe three games. I like to play a lot of different games. I also am guilty of having more games that I need to finally try. But you see Apex? There is just something about it that keeps me coming back again and again and again and again and again and again. Believe it or not, that was all. Thank you for enduring all of my blabbering. If you enjoyed, why not like, subscribe, comment, ring the goddamn bell, maybe share and whatever else you can think of. I am sure I forgot something. My last big video got a lot of attention, a lot more than I ever expected and I honestly still giggle when I look at that subscriber count being above 20. Thank you to everyone who subscribed. Believe it or not, this is actually my fourth channel, but also it is the first one to go above 20 subscribers so this really means a lot to me. Anyway, thank you for watching, bye!